Good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to say thank you, Cheryl, for inviting me here. And um, I was truly impressed by the pictures you showed this morning. Um, I have deepest respect for what you were able to do. Um, also, I was uh, privileged to observe from a distance what um, loving rapport you enjoy with many of the families that are perhaps here and um, come to you in your practice. Um, very touching. Um, my name again is Stefan Knaus. I have a practice here in the Southland. Um, I've been involved in prosthetics for over 25 years and specifically with um, aesthetic restorations of all sorts, not just ears um, for the last 15. And um, I have assembled just a handful of cases for you this morning which are representative of the most common kinds of ear situations we will see. Um, they, they'll exclude uh, cancer situations, but be more inclined to um, uh, microtia and these sorts of um, uh, conditions. So um, let me uh, figure out how to command this thing. Um, there it is. So um, this first case is a before and after case. Um, this gentleman came to us uh, after having had some ear reconstructive surgery and he no longer wished to go through more surgeries. Um, you'll see that that um, the reconstruction, the surgical reconstruction created some level of relief and we needed to um, figure out spatially how we can uh, create something over the top of that and still match the projection on the other side of his head. So the ear on his sound ear, that would be his left ear, uh, excuse me, his right ear, as um, the left as you're viewing it, um, was laid back surgically also to try to mimic the reconstruction. So we had very little space with which to um, uh, loft an ear over the top of that. And so we start by making a diagnostic piece that helps our clients appreciate just the spatial um, uh, allowances available to us and um, they can also understand and practice what it means to place these things and um, and um, evaluate you know the future form so this is another type of uh, case uh, a grade four um, microtia I presume and in these cases we're without removing the vestige um, vestigial ear, we can sometimes incorporate those into the form. And um, Dr. Lewin had described, uh, oops, excuse me, hang on. Um, I'm looking for the pointer now. Nope, what have I done? Pointer, this one? Never mind. Um, <laughs> the concha is the hollow that we all associate with the ear and um, that has been painted somewhat to look shadowy, and the, um, the it's the red dot, thank you. The, the vestige of the ear lays pretty much through this column right here and down into the lobe. Um, this is what I think you would call a, a grade four um, developed ear, and um, in this case, you can see that there's even greater filling of the conchal region right here, but it can still be appear acceptable. Um, and um, though, though we paint it, um, it, it can give the shadowy appearance. Um, in some instances, we will um, work with um, either complete or partially removed ears due to trauma or one situation or another. And in these cases, it's most challenging to make um, the rubber silicone ear continuous with an anatomical form. So we're now not trying to cover something, but actu actually extend beyond an existing form. Um, I'd like to show you, you're welcome to come up to me later and I have some samples and I'll show you in person how we accomplish that. It's a bit hard to demonstrate that on a slideshow. Um, and in this case, we have a complete 
your loss due to a burn injury. And the challenge on these is, excuse me, it did it again, uh, to hide the long uh, edge of margin. Um, it's done principally by creating um, a, a transparent or a semi-transparent uh, edge. And then when, once that is backed by something wet or a glue, then uh, it, it blends with the existing skin colors and um, um, provides a, a nice gradation to the existing skin. Uh, let me also mention, um, sometimes small anatomical features such as this can help in uh, the patient's ability to register the piece uh, and to align it for correct positioning. And then it, in some instances, it even helps carry the piece so that um, it's not necessary to m remove these things always. Um, if, this was, if this piece was any larger, it actually would help carry glasses and things like that. So um, it relieved the skin from the burden of carrying it simply by virtue of the adhesive that's used in holding these on. Um, so this last, this last case is um, an implant retained um, case. And I wanted to take you quickly through uh, a number of stages. And again, this is very brief. Um, but in this case, this gentleman presented with um, some rather large ear tags. And he came to us already persuaded he wanted implant retained um, and implant retained prosthesis. So uh, we worked with the surgeon to uh, create some photo references that would guide him in his surgery in terms of where those implants should be placed, um, where we would like to most uh, likely see those. And then we also provide the surgeon with an acrylic template that accompanies him into surgery with uh, pilot holes. Just, just where we would like to see those. And they lie somewhere along um, this, this blue base of the ear. Um, on the outside, it's understood to be somewhere below the, what we call the anti-helix. And um, so, um, you know, after the surgery, we can reevaluate our placement. Um, this, is, this is where we had located located it, and you can see that the uppermost implant lays, lies outside of what we had hoped for. However, the inferior two are on or very close to our ideal location. And we respect the fact that any surgeon has to make a judgment in surgery um, as to what kind of bone integrity they find for the placement of these. So um, we're not going to be pedantic about the fact we needed these in one sort of one place or another, but um, but two implants are generally enough for us to work with, and we're fond of using magnets as opposed to gold bars, which um, I was trained on initially. But magnets make things very easy, and they they um, even when the prosthesis is not worn, um, present the lowest um, possible uh, you know uh, appearance liability, if you will. So from this stage, we will. Um, take new impressions and um, develop a diagnostic prosthesis so that, again the client can understand the spatial um, uh, presentation of the ear just on the basis of form and on the basis of location and then from that point um, we'll produce a what we call an intrinsically painted ear that is to say we like to place the colors on the interior of the mold rather than painting it all on the outside, and that affords us um, a much more durable piece uh, and a piece that um, can reflect a high level of surface detail, which we can put in our sculptures. And it allows us to play with, um, with luster, which is a big issue in terms of the realism of a piece. Um, that is to say, the inside of the ear will have a waxy, shiny appearance many times, whereas the helix or outer area will have uh, a fuzzy appearance. When light hits it, it can sometimes even appear like there's a little uh, sheen or halo around an ear. We like to play with those types of qualities. They add a lot to the final realism of a piece. Um, here again is the, the simple progression of this case. OK. 
Okay, that, that sums up um, a very short introduction to our field. And um, a great deal of what we do, again, are not years. Um, we have done, I came to realize recently, well over a thousand different met, um, aesthetic appliances for people over the last 15 years. Only a small portion of those are ears. <coughs> but um, this is my, cl my uh, artistic staff. Uh, the gentleman in the middle looking like a little bit like Salvador Dali is Mason Traeger, Mr. Mason. And, um, and then Gina Cohen on the left. I need to um, credit her with a lot of the work you so just saw. She's been with us seven years and is a very fine artist. And um, so I thank you very much for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs>